Hello everyone, Dr. Polaris here. Well, this video's been a long time coming, as I finally get to, to talk about one of my personal favourite dinosaurs, Dilophosaurus, the two-crested reptile. In truth, I've always been a fan of this animal, ever since I first laid eyes on pictures of its skeleton in my dinosaur book as a kid. There was just something so distinctive about it. Perhaps it was the head crests, the slender, agile body, or the oddly hooked upper jaw that caught my attention. Somewhat strangely, as I was a dinosaur-obsessed kid growing up in the 90s, my love of Dilophosaurus was not due to Jurassic Park. I didn't actually watch that film until I was a teenager, so the franchise actually doesn't hold any nostalgic value for me at all. In fact, the first entry in the Jurassic franchise that I personally saw in theatres was Jurassic Park 3 in 2001. Regardless of this, I think it would be best to start with an analysis of the Dilophosaurus in Spielberg's 1993 film, as this has become the standard way in which many people unfamiliar with paleontology imagine this animal. In a famous scene that takes place near the midpoint of the film, disgruntled computer programmer Dennis Nedry, played by Wayne Knight, attempts to find his way to the island's dock in order to smuggle the stolen dinosaur embryos back to the mainland. However, due to a tropical storm and the lack of power in the park, he gets lost and crashes his jeep into the Dilophosaurus enclosure. After comically slipping down a hill, he comes face to face with a small dog-sized dinosaur that appears to be relatively harmless, doing nothing but stare at Nedry and ignoring his attempt to distract it by throwing a stick. But, while attempting to get back into the jeep, the Dilophosaurus approaches him, revealing an impressive neck frill and spitting a caustic black goo into Nedry's eyes. Blinded, the bespectacled man climbs back into the car, only to find that the dinosaur has climbed through the open window and proceeds to maul Nedry as the camera cuts away. The Dilophosaurus here is notably tiny, being about half the height of a grown man, and possesses a scaly greenish-grey hide. While the frill is more colourful, being a mix of yellows and reds. The snout is also quite blocky, looking quite similar to that of the film's take on Velociraptor. While Nedry's line about the animal not being one of its big brothers may suggest that this Dilophosaurus might have been a juvenile, the screenwriters and Stan Winston's production designers have since revealed that they downsized the animal so as to avoid any confusion with the Velociraptors. The real genus, on the other hand, could reach about 7 metres or up to 23 feet long. In addition, the depiction of the genus in Michael Crichton's 1990 novel is quite different. Just on a brief tangent, not many people I've spoken to are even aware that the Spielberg film is based on a book in the first place. This is a shame, as though I like the 1993 movie, I think the novel is better and is definitely worth a read. Although, if you haven't read it before and are expecting a family-friendly adventure, then be warned. The book has a much darker and more cynical tone than the film, even going into bloody horror territory on occasion. Examples of this include an early scene in which a sleeping baby is torn apart by three escaped Procompsognathus, and, of course, Nedry's fatal encounter with the Dilophosaurus. Here, the animal is shown to be much larger than the movie version, with Nedry estimating that it stands at a height of about 10 feet. It has yellowish skin with black spots, somewhat like a leopard, while its head crests are bright red. Notably, it also lacks a neck frill, and its call is described as being soft and hooting, like an owl's. As Nedry attempts to get back to the jeep, which he hasn't crashed but parked near a concrete barricade, he encounters the Dilophosaurus, standing in the road at the very edge of the area illuminated by the car's headlights. It stands there staring at him, until it snaps its head to one side, launching a glob of toxic saliva into Nedry's eyes. We then get a graphic description of the portly computer programmer realising that he's been blinded, collapsing to the ground in extreme pain. As he lies there, he can hear the Dilophosaurus approaching, and then feels a searing pain in his stomach as the dinosaur disembowels him and carries him away, with Nedry's head in the animal's jaws. While this depiction is closer to the actual size of Dilophosaurus, it is actually oversized rather than undersized with the largest known specimens of the genus suggested to have reached almost 8 feet tall rather than 10 feet. However, unlike the film adaptation, the novel goes out of its way to question just how accurate Jurassic Park's resurrected dinosaurs really are to their prehistoric counterparts, with there being a whole conversation between John Hammond and Dr. Henry Wu on this subject that was completely left out of the movie. 
This led to the film's dinosaurs being taken as scientifically accurate by many members of the general public, with the frilled, venom-spitting Dilophosaurus influencing pop culture depictions of the animal, such as in the Ark Survival Evolved and Primal Carnage video games, as well as in Magic the Gathering's frilled Death Spitter card. The discovery of the actual, non-venomous Dilophosaurus took place in 1940, on land belonging to the Navajo Nation in northern Arizona, Local indigenous man Jesse Phillips uncovered three specimens of a medium-sized theropod dinosaur in the outcroppings of the Kayenta Formation near Tuba City. Hearing of a 1942 expedition to the area by members of the University of California Museum of Paleontology, Phillips guided three representatives of the team to the site, where the three specimens were unearthed. The first was nearly complete, lacking only the front part of the skull, parts of the pelvis, and some vertebrae. The second was very eroded, and included the front of the skull, lower jaws, some vertebrae, limb bones, and an articulated hand. The third was so eroded that it consisted of only vertebral fragments. The first specimen was covered in plaster and shipped back to the University of California Museum, where it was officially described and labelled Megalosaurus weatherilli, which was a common naming practice at the time, with Megalosaurus being used as a wastebasket genus. In 1964, a further expedition returned to the site in order to determine the age of the Kayenta Formation, finding that it was early Jurassic in origin. An additional near-complete specimen of the same theropod was also found, which possessed a much better preserved skull that showed beyond all doubt that this animal had a distinctive double bony crest on the top of the head. By 1970, it was realised that this was a new genus, and was christened Dilophosaurus with paleontologist Samuel Wells publishing a detailed description of the animal in 1984. Wells found that Dilophosaurus was a slender, agile carnivore that possessed a relatively weak bite, indicating that the genus was probably a scavenger, being unable to take large herbivorous prey. These observations were challenged in the following decades, with Robert Barker finding that Dilophosaurus was almost certainly an active apex predator, despite its relative fame thanks to Jurassic Park. The genus remained quite poorly understood in scientific circles until 2020, when paleontologists Adam Marsh and Timothy Rowe undertook a systematic redescription of every known specimen of Dilophosaurus, showing that the animal had a much stronger set of jaws than was previously assumed, being able to puncture bone. Overall, a highly detailed picture of the genus has emerged from Marsh and Rowe's study. Dilophosaurus is now known to have reached a maximum length of about 7 metres, or 23 feet, with the largest known specimen achieving a mass of roughly 400 kilograms, or 880 pounds, being about the size of a big male grizzly bear. The snout was generally narrow, and possessed a distinctive kink in the upper jaw below the nasal opening, similar to what is seen in Coelophysis, while the teeth were long, thin, and recurved, being well adapted for slashing bites with puncture marks on the holotype of the sauropodomorph Cerasaurus, revealing that Dilophosaurus could pierce the bones of relatively large prey. It was native to what is now the southwestern United States, during the Cinemurian and Taachian stages of the early Jurassic, between 195 and 183 million years ago, being an inhabitant of the Kayenta Formation. During the early Jurassic, this region lay just south of a large sandy desert, somewhat like the Sahara today representing a tropical, dry floodplain that was subject to pronounced wet and dry seasons. Dilophosaurus was the apex predator here, living alongside a variety of basal mammalia forms, crocodilomorphs, and a diverse smattering of non-avian dinosaurs at the very beginning of their rise as the world's dominant large tetrapods. These include the tiny basal Thariophoran Scotellosaurus, which was the most common dinosaur in the formation, the aforementioned browsing Cerasaurus, as well as poorly known small coelophysids. The majority of these animals would have been on the menu for Dilophosaurus, which was an agile, active predator with a relatively fast metabolism, as indicated by the animal's hollow bones and systems of interconnected air sacs which allowed for efficient respiration. In addition to the jaws, Dilophosaurus possessed relatively well-muscled forelimbs that were capable of grabbing smaller prey, while the large head would have made first contact with bigger animals like Cerasaurus. The hands were four-fingered, a trait typical of more basal theropods, although the fourth digit was tiny and vestigial. The prominent head crest was almost certainly utilised as a display structure, 
possibly in mating rituals, or to signal the age and overall health of the animal. As the crests were constructed of thin-walled bone and covered in a layer of keratin, they are quite poorly preserved in the fossil record, meaning that we currently don't know exactly how the crests looked when the animal was alive. The adult holotype specimen of Dilophosaurus possessed numerous injuries, which would certainly have made hunting more challenging with the highest number of paleopathologies of any known non-avian dinosaur. The forelimbs and pectoral girdle were badly damaged, with the left scapula and radius being fractured, while the third digit on the right hand was deformed and was unable to be flexed. It is unknown what caused this long list of injuries. Perhaps they were sustained during a fight with another Dilophosaurus. Regardless of the cause, the majority of these injuries were healed, indicating that this animal was able to survive for months and possibly years despite being in severe pain. The relationship of Dilophosaurus to other early theropods is still a bit uncertain. Once thought to be a close relative of Coelophysoids, it has since been found to be more derived than these animals, probably being the sister taxon to the clade Avirostra, which contains most of the more derived later Jurassic theropods. It has sometimes been considered to be a close relative of animals such as Zupesaurus and Cryolophosaurus. Although more recent studies have found Dilophosaurus to be more derived than either of these genera. In this way, the double crested reptile represents something of a bridge between the more basal theropods of the Triassic and the larger, more derived forms that exploded in diversity during the Jurassic. In conclusion, then, this iconic yet misunderstood dinosaur was one of the rare examples of an animal featured in Jurassic Park being larger in real life than it was on the silver screen. I still can't really say why Dilophosaurus is among my favourite dinosaurs, although I certainly do think it was a predator with character, especially given its pretty flamboyant head crests. Thanks for watching everyone. The next episode will be covering the fossil history of Antarctica, the frozen continent at the bottom of the world that was not always so inhospitable to life. See you again soon. Cheerio.